We begin with Iran and two stories over the past 10 days that show that when it comes to the coverage of the Islamic Republic, all is not as it seems. First, the online opinion writer who wasn't, Heshmat Alavi, was once cited by the White House as a credible commentator on Iran. But he'd have far more credibility if he actually existed. It turns out he's a fictional persona reportedly created by the MEK, Mujahideen Ekhark, a shadowy group opposed to the Iranian government and supported by Washington. Then there's the Iran Disinformation Project, funded entirely by the American taxpayer, ostensibly to counter Iranian propaganda. It trolls and sometimes smears Iranian-American commentators and journalists online. The government in Tehran is no innocent player in all this. It also tries to engineer what gets said and read online. As the Trump administration continues with its hawkish talk on Iran, dissecting this debate and figuring out who's driving it is proving more complicated by the day. Our starting point this week is Washington, D.C. Heshmat Alavi, a self-described human rights and political activist with 30,000 followers on Twitter, a critic of the Iranian government advocating regime change, and a remarkably prolific writer, widely published. His columns appeared on the websites of the American business magazine Forbes, as well as The Hill, The Federalist, and The Daily Caller, on the Saudi-owned Al Arabiya, on the Voice of America's Persian website, until the American news outlet The Intercept published this story, saying that Heshmat Alavi did not even exist, that he was a creation of the MEK, an Iranian opposition group schooled in the black arts of propaganda, and that all the news outlets that had published Alavi, in Forbes's case 61 times, had been gamed. What was shocking was that Forbes magazine, Daily Caller, Federalist, the Hill published a person who did not exist. We're talking about someone who they thought existed, but never bothered to verify in any way, shape or form. And I don't think you would ever see that happening on any other issue. I think this is an Iran specific thing in which the standards and the bar in the US media, particularly on the right, is essentially non-existent. And his content wasn't, very subtle. If you go back and see the record of what was published under Heshmat Alavi, you can see where he's coming from. But the fact that nobody realized just shows a lack of responsibility on the part of the media. And he really utilized that. He had a track record of published articles that then made his audience on Twitter believe that he's a real person and he's a credible and published author. Forbes uh, failed on so many levels. Um, if one journalist could discover that Hishmat Alavi was a fake, fictitious character, an entire organization as well-funded as Forbes could have. I had challenged Hishmat uh, several times on the misinformation that he was propagating online, and uh, Hishmat never, never responded. So uh, naturally, I, I, you know, I attributed that to. Um, a journalist with a gigantic ego or someone who is very busy, but now we know. The group that fooled those media outlets, the MEK, should have been well known to all of them. The U.S. considered it a terror organization until 2012, and since that classification was dropped, the MEK has cozied up to American officials who share its hawkish views on Iran. One of them, President Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, spoke at the group's annual conference in 2017. There is a viable opposition to the rule of the Ayatollahs, and that opposition is centered in this room today. The MEK runs a sizable troll farm in Albania, where its operatives target online voices who express support for the Iranian government. The Iran Disinformation Project does a lot of that too, only it's based in Washington and is paid for by American taxpayers. 
its brief is to counter disinformation from Iran, but the project has gone much further than that. Among the people it trolls, Iranian-American journalists and NGO workers like Tara Seperifar of Human Rights Watch. She landed in Iran disinfo's crosshairs after sending this tweet, seeking information from Iranians on how economic sanctions are affecting the availability of medicine there. It was a purely research-based tweet, and it was in Persian. It was intended to towards the Iranian audience to help me find some uh, some evidence um, that I could use for my research. They retweeted my tweet and said something along the line of, despite the fact that uh, hundreds of protesters have been killed since 2018, Human Rights Watch researcher is working hard to prove Iran's right. Any moderate or nuanced view or reporting of Iran has been triggering their attacks. I had been called a mouthpiece, a lobbyist for the regime. Other people had been called apologists or lobbyists for simply voicing their criticism against President Trump's policies or a nuanced view of what is going on inside Iran that wasn't seen as hardline enough by the Iran disinfo group. Here you have an entity that was supposed to fight Iranian propaganda online. Instead, it was actually spending almost all of its time attacking critics of the Trump administration's Iran policy. To make it worse, the fund that came from the State Department was actually designed to fight ISIS propaganda and Russian interference in the United States. Instead, the Trump administration diverted that money to fight critics of Trump's Iran policy. Including Jason Rezaian, a Washington Post writer. Iran disinfo went after him, which was ironic because just three years ago, the same State Department that funds the project was lobbying to free Rezaian from prison in Iran. The authorities there are notorious for their treatment of journalists. This past week, they revoked the credentials of the New York Times' bureau chief there without explanation. Tehran also invests in its own online disinformation campaigns, setting up fake news websites, generating spurious articles, and creating online personas. That was what Iran Disinfo was created to fight against before it turned to trolling critics and lobbying for regime change. And it's just one of the many players in Washington lobbying on one side of this story or the other. Some Iranians accuse the D.C.-based National Iranian American Council, NIAC, of in fact being the unofficial lobbying arm of the Iranian reformist movement. The MEK um, pushes their own political agenda by creating fictitious characters such as Hishmat Alavi and NIAC brands uh, people who do not agree with them as uh, warmongers. Iran disinfo engages in similar tactics. So what I'm trying to say is everybody is engaging in those uh, tactics. Iran has multiple diverse voices and for certain groups with more uh, financial resources to be able to monopolize this space um, is, is doing them disservice. Certain positions are much more marginal and certain viewpoints are much more mainstream. And the viewpoints that Nayak has represented, you know, uh, holding Iran responsible for its human rights violation, but at the same time engaging in dialogue rather than coercion and war, is vastly supported by the Iranian American community. If there are any campaigns by anyone to manipulate the debate, manipulate social media, then obviously that should be shut down. Iran disinfo has avoided being shut down so far, but it has taken a big hit over its rogue behavior. Yes, so the funding does remain uh, suspended for uh, this um, entity. Uh, and it, the, there's a review process that's ongoing right now. Together, the Iran Disinformation Project and the MEK's Hashmet Alavi deception provide lessons for anyone, news outlets included, dealing with the Iran story. With hawks in the Trump White House flexing American muscle and placing maximum pressure on Iran. Iran has been a very dangerous player, very bad player. They're a nation of terror, and we won't put up with it. The Times call for extreme caution. 
in separating fact from fiction, legitimate voices from paid trolls, and credible commentators from virtual ones. For analysts, reporters, policymakers, anyone who is trying to make sense of Iran these days, if their only point of reference is what's happening on social media, they should think twice before publishing it as, this is how Iranians feel about these things. One thing that these two seemingly unrelated stories that have come out at the same time prove is that this space is highly manipulated, and it's far from a reflection of Iranian public opinion.